ask you to please uh, be seated. I'm Mark Jurgens, my president of the American Academy of Religion. And today it is my great honor and privilege to introduce Tariq Ramadan, uh, a great scholar often described as one of Europe's most influential intellectuals. Uh, you know him from his publications, from his uh, articles, uh, from his frequent quotations. I'm, I'm dazzled with the number of books in the bookstore uh, that has his picture on the cover. Uh, and most of all, from his thoughtful observations about many changes in modern life, and particularly the role of Islam in Europe. Uh, as you know, uh, Europe uh, is a fulcrum of change in many ways. Uh, and it's often been observed that the future of relations uh, between the United States and what is called, often called the Muslim world, although I'm pleased that Tariq Ramadan doesn't like to call it that because there's so much diversity, so much difference within any religious tradition and any religious community, it, it's a false assumption to characterize it in any simple way. But nonetheless, the future of, of, uh, of European civilizational and Muslim civilizational relations such as that is, I think, uh, will be in the crucible uh, of Europe. So for many years now, the American Academy of Religion has been trying to invite Tariq Ramadan to its annual meeting. This began five years ago. The invitation has been repeated, uh, unfortunately stymied by uh, an uh, intervention that I, I don't want to rehearse here, uh, but which has been unfortunate and which is still ongoing, and then the Obama administration, I think, quickly and will be resolved in a way that would allow uh, this uh, extraordinary intellectual to speak on campuses in the, in the United States to which he has been invited. But by happy coincidence this year, the American Academy of Religion annual meeting is not in the United States, but in Canada, uh, which does not have such petty restrictions. Thank you, Canada. <laughs> So thank you, Canada, for allowing me to proudly introduce our plenary speaker for this morning, Professor Tariq Ramadan. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much once again for, for this repeated invitation. Uh, eventually we are here together in Canada and sometimes we have to uh, remind the U.S. that it's good to follow in the footsteps of Canada in some of the political issues. Uh, so happy to be here and, and also able to meet with so many uh, scholars, professors or researchers coming from the state that I am unable to, having been unable to meet during the last few years. Hopefully we are waiting for a positive decision in the coming weeks and months. But uh, uh, as we are here now, let me just try to, to come to uh, uh, some of the points that I'm trying to raise in, in, in not the last book. The last book is, is just now on the uh, Western Muslims. It's called What I Believe. But just before this, I, I wrote a book called Radical Reform, Islamic Ethics and Liberation. And uh, this book is not an easy book. It's an academic book. And I just want to share with you some views about it and, and what I'm trying to do. Uh, and, and also to, to first start by uh, try to uh, uh, localize where this book is in all the work I have been doing during the last 25 years. Uh, very often I'm presented as a Western Muslim working on Western issues, and, and it's not really this that I, I'm only trying to do. For the last 25 years, I have two series of books. One series is really about Muslims living in Muslim-majority countries. All the challenges that we have, and you go in Muslim, uh, the West, and the challenges of uh, uh, modernity, uh, also the books that I have, the dialogues with some scholars, these are books on what is happening in Muslim-majority countries. And there is a, a series of books on, on Western Muslims and what is happening to be European Muslim, Western Muslims, and the future of Islam, and the last book, What I Believe, which is a, a very small book of clarification for people who have no time to read more, because I was told that the thick books are not read. So a small book on, on uh, clarifying some of the, the, the principles. This book, 
uh, uh, radical reform, Islamic ethics and, and liberation is not about Western Muslims. It's really about Islam and Muslims uh, around the world in Muslim majority countries as well as in the West facing contemporary challenges. So it's really how do we have to come back to the principles and the text of our religion and try to find a way to come with uh, faithful answers or responses to contemporary challenges? And how do we have to deal with this? For 20 years, and this was also what I studied when I was in classical Islamic education uh, tra and training when I was in Egypt, mainly I was focusing on fiqh, Islamic law and jurisprudence. And in my work, uh, uh, what I have uh, written on, on Muslims living in Muslim-majority countries, about human rights, about democracy, but deep, deeper than that, anything which has to do with the concept of Sharia, defining Sharia, understanding the concept of, of the, 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 the very essence of al-ibadat, al wal-mu'amalat, the, 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 the worship, and, and anything which has to do with the social affairs, but also this terminology from within, this is part of what I was, have been trying to do, and mainly dealing with law and jurisprudence. On the other side, uh, this was exactly the same with new challenges and the way we have to understand our presence in secular societies, citizenship, our sense of belonging, loyalty, all these concepts were uh, studied. And realizing at one point that I have reached a limit. A limit in anything which has to do with reform and mainly something which was quite important for me. I'm coming from the reformist tradition. I'm not representing all the Muslims. I'm representing a trend or being part of a trend which is trying to say something, which is I take the text seriously as a believer from within the Islamic tradition. But I'm trying to, to show that these texts are to be contextually approached, historically understood, and there are levels. Some of the texts are immutable as to the principles, and others have to be contextualized. So this is something which is a reformist tradition uh, and this is what I have been trying to do in, with the, the key concept that we all know when we study Islam and Islamic studies is ishtihad, the, the, the uh, uh, autonomous or uh, rational take on texts while the texts are open for interpretation and, and these are the great majority of the Islamic texts in the Quran and in the prophetic tradition. Reaching a limit by saying, I was talking and I was dealing with other Muslim scholars. We were using the same concept of reform, but we didn't mean the same thing. And this is where my take on everything which is said by many Muslim scholars in the West or in the Muslim majority countries is very much connected to two key words, which are understandable, useful, necessary, but problematic is the two concepts of al-haja wa darura Al-haja is we are in need of new answers, so we are coming with new answers because we are in need. This uh, concept is helping us to find new solutions, but because we are in need. And the darura is imperative. So we are facing a new challenge. It's imperative to change our mind. So these are very useful and necessary, and I was supporting all the endeavors coming from Muslim scholars using this and using ishtihad as uh, the critical thinking to come with new answers. With one main difference is that at the end of the day, if we only use these two concepts, you uh, uh, end up with something which is adaptation reform. You look at the world, the world is imposing onto you the state of affairs, so in the name of the imperative necessity, you come with a new answer. But this new answer is adaptation reform, adaptational reform, in one way or in another. And what I understood from reform is that if there is a meaning in our religions, in our religious teachings coming from Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but also Buddhism and any spirituality, we are not here to adapt to the world. We are here to transform the world for the better. So the main thesis is how do we go from adaptational reform to transformational reform? And if you are obsessed with law, by definition, laws are about adaptation. The mindset, jurisprudence, by definition, is you adapt to the state of affairs. So you, you find new answers because you are dealing with new challenges. So how do you get the vision, ends, objectives, that in the name of these objectives, you act on the world to change it for the better and not only to adapt yourself in all the fields? And this is where, for this, 
in the Muslim majority countries dealing with almost all the what we call now the great scholars of our time I, wa I was lucky enough to be in touch with all of them almost to t to 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 listen to talk to to exchange with them within the Muslim majority countries and also with scholars and intellectuals in the West I say now we are reaching a limit if we are obsessed with law and jurisprudence, we are going to go for adaptational reform as the only answer. Well, my point is really to say no. Let us now come to the fundamentals of law and jurisprudence, helping us to get the essence, what could help us to extract from the Islamic teachings and the Islamic references, objectives helping us to be faithful to the text, but to change the world for the better, so the transformational reform. So this is crossing the board, not only for Western Muslims, but I'm quite sure, and this is what I said in the book Western Muslims and the Future of Islam, and before that in Europe, to be a European Muslim, is that our experience in the West will have a tremendous impact on what is happening in Muslim majority countries. But I will also say to people living in the West, don't think that the only place where the Muslims are thinking are in the West. I remember after a TV program when I was coming with all these ideas, a woman write me a, an, SMS, an, an email telling me, ah, yes, you are open-minded because you were educated in Switzerland. Meaning by this, if you were to be educated over there, so your mind is open because of where you are living. And I, I would say that very often we don't see the vibrant discussions and, and what I said yesterday in the Muslim majority countries, in Indonesia, in Asia, in Malaysia, in Africa, and not only in the Arab world, because Islam is not to be reduced to the Arab world. The Arab world for us, all of us, maybe not the best example we have to follow, or the Arab countries today. In any, in any way, I'm speaking about producing culture, discussing, reading, and the political system, which are all problematic. So, the point is that even in the Arab world, even today in Saudi Arabia, our perception from our side is not reflecting what is really happening over there among women, about you know, the discussion among scholars. It's very deep and it's very important to listen to this dynamic, and not only between the radical and the, and the nonviolent or the, the violent extremists, no, within uh, uh, the society I think is quite important. So having said that, so how do we go to, for, for this and, and, and in which way we have to to promote them. Very quickly, and this is something that I have to say, and very often for, for the Muslim audiences, but also for my uh, uh, fellow scholars and the people who are working in that field, I'm not saying that we have to reform Islam, because I think that uh, faithfulness to the principles is not to reform Islam, it's to reform the Muslim minds and interpretations. So once again, it's quite important here that uh, for me, the text, the very word of God, the Quran is the Quran and it's the very word of God for the Muslims and the prophetic tradition is a set of texts that we have to respect. Now, the point for me is really to come to reforming the Muslim mind, the interpretations, the limits, the understanding, and even the sources on which we have to rely to understand the, the challenges of today. So this is something which is important. I'm not uh, 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 saying this. Second thing which is quite important is that because I'm using very often the concept of reform uh, and uh, saying that there is a reformist tradition, uh, there are two reactions. The first reaction is coming from uh, uh, Muslims saying, oh, you are using reform because in fact you are taking this from the Christian tradition. So it's really close to reformation, the Protestant trend, so you are Christianizing Islam or you are alien to the very essence of Islam. And alienation is a word that I'm listening, and some people are putting me outside the realm of Islam because I'm using this. I'm saying, you know, and once again, I'm repeating this everywhere, the most dangerous thing when it comes to alienation is not alienation, it's double alienation. Double alienation is what you think that what is coming from your tradition is coming from outside because you don't know your own tradition. So this double alienation is ignorance of the self and produce or projecting onto others things that are coming from you, that are part of you, but you don't know yourself, so you think it's coming from the colonization of or, or, or the, the, the minds or colonization of the, 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 the teachings and, and the, the, the fields that we are uh, uh, talking about. So reform, al-islah, wa tajdeed wal-ihya, all these Arabic words are part of the very classical Islamic tradition.
This is not new. And even in the prophetic tradition, there is something saying that there is someone or a group of people sent to this community every century to help this community to renew its understanding. I mean, to renew its understanding, it could be to renew its mind, it to renew its interpretations. So this is the very essence and what the classical tradition was understanding. So I'm not coming from a modern Islam far from the roots. I'm coming back to the roots to say we may have a wrong inter interpretation of the very essence of Islam and that the very essence of Islam is there is no faithfulness without evolution. Evolution of your mind, evolution of your connection to the world, the understanding of the world when it comes to understanding and interpretation, interpreting the text. So this is a, a, a tension, a, a dialectical process between text and context that I was talking about in the realm of uh, fiqh and usul al-fiqh. It's a step further. By saying what? Three main theses are in that book that for me are quite important. The first one is what I said that we should go from adaptation, adaptational reform to transformational reform. And if you come to something which is quite important, you will see that uh, Islam and the Islamic message is all about transforming. And the spiritual dimension coming from the mystical uh, trends, but also from the very essence of what the, 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 the normative scholars or the scholars leading with, uh, dealing with law were saying is that you will be a good Muslim or you will be a good practicing Muslims, men and women, if you know how to transform the self. So you have a personal responsibility to make or to change your heart, to transform your heart. And by the way, this is the universal message of the inner journey towards purification of the self. Meaning by this, that this is what you find in Judaism, this is what you find in Christianity, this is what you find in Buddhism. This is a universal, intimate message, an intimate uh, dimension that we have. But what does it mean? It means, in fact, when you come back to the very essence of our religion, that it's all about transforming ourselves. Transforming, not uh, uh, reforming to adapt ourselves to who we are. There is nothing in the spiritual messages saying you have to adapt yourself to the way you are. No. You know who you are and you change your, you, you change your being in something which is better than what you are. By commanding the bad di dimensions of yourself, the bad temptations, and trying to master this dimension to become better. So the spiritual message is all about transformational reform. But to do this, you need to, do, to know two things. Two knowledges are important. The first set of field of knowledge is what are the principles and the objectives that you have to know? What, in which way you have to transform yourself? To be more generous? To show more solidarity? To master your anger? So you know the principles and the objectives. You should know what the texts are telling you. So the revelation is coming with a set of rules and objectives that you have to achieve, understand, in order to change this. And this is universal for all of us. There is no spiritual tradition telling us, lie, it's good for you. There is no. Or be full of anger, it's good for you. Maybe good for you, bad for the others. We all know what our spiritual messages and teachings are telling us. So you should know this. But there is another knowledge which is very important. You cannot use these principles and these objectives if you don't get a very deep knowledge of yourself. Why? Because the same principles are not going to be used the same way with your own self. We may have the same heart, but it's not exactly the same because we, know, we need to know who we are in order to use these objectives and these principles the right way. Why? Because if you want to change the self, you should start by knowing the self. You should now, by, you know, what Socrates was saying, know yourself is the very beginning of any spiritual journey. And if you get that, you know, very often when you come to Islam, you should understand what is coming from the spiritual dimension to understand how you have to deal with the normative dimension. This is exactly the way you have to deal with jihad to understand in which way you use jihad in the collective life. Because jihad is all about resisting your own self to be better. So it's resistance to what is bad in you to become better. It's the transformational reform. Exactly the same, you understand that to, to go through a transformational reform of the self, you need two knowledges. Know the principles and know yourself. 
know the texts, the principles, and know the context on which you are going to use these principles. This is the only way. Because to change the self, you know, you need to know, for example, for me, it may be that generosity is not a problem because I was born generous. But I may have a problem with anger because I have a bad temper. It's an example, okay? Uh, <laughs> I have a temper by nature. So every one of us has his or her own challenges, depending on the self. So these knowledges are so important. Come now to something which is in which way today we have to go towards transformational reform. And in the first three chapters of the book, I'm coming with something which is the very roots of the jurisprudence and Islamic law principles, the schools that we have. Shafi'i, Hanbali, all this is studied in the, this is why I'm saying for people who are not specialists, you can go to the, the fourth uh, uh, chapter, you will have the case studies, practical thing, and then you can come to the theory afterward, because it's not easy. It's not easy, but it's necessary. You want to deal with Islamic issues today, it's very important to get the framework, to get the, the very roots of a tradition. So the scholars at the beginning, what they were doing, is something which is really important here, is to come back to the text, and they were extracting from the text frameworks and saying, we have four main sources. Al-Quran, wa sunnah wal ijma wal qiyas. The Quran, the prophetic tradition, the consensus of the scholars and Al-Qiyas, which is reasoning by analogy. So when you have a new issue, you look at what the text was saying on a specific issue, and by analogy, you find uh, a solution. But in fact, implicitly, all the scholars were saying that the context is very important. You have to look at the context, and by knowing the context, you know how you deal with this. And the first one, Malik, who is very much understood as someone who was very strict on this, came with a very important concept, which is al-masalih al-mursala, meaning by this that there are situations where the text is silent. So you use your mind to take, to take from the text the spirit of the law to understand that in this silence you should find your way of dealing with the context. So the context is telling you something. It's also a source. So by and this is what I'm studying in the text, in fact, you understand that the context is per se a source of law. Why? Because you have natural laws that you have to take into account. You have to understand how it works, experimental sciences. You have to know about culture. Why, for example, Abu Hanifa was one of those scholars coming to the Muslims by saying, when you have to pay the zakat, in the text, in the prophetic tradition, you have to give something which is material. You have to give seeds and things. He said, no. Because he was himself a trader, kneeling with the context, he said, no, you can, by analogy, give money. Because it's easier for the trader, and everything in Islam is about to make things easy for people. But to know how to make things easy for people, you should know what you are talking about. You should know the context. You should be a trader to be able to say, give the money is easier for the traders. You should know the context. So implicitly, it's always there. And what we have been doing in the name of fiqh, which is law and jurisprudence, is to give the authority of scholars of the text and less to scholars of the context. So this is where, to get the transformational reform, the first thing that we have to do is to put the two at the same level, exactly as we are experiencing in the spiritual transformational reform. Because if you know all the rules, as to yourself, and you don't know yourself, you are not going to transform yourself. You need to know yourself. So it's the two knowledges together. So the first thesis here is that to go for this, to go for, from, a from a, an adaptational reform to a transformational reform, we have to put the scholars at the same level and the two sources at the same level. So at the end of the third chapter, I'm coming with a new categorization of the objectives. But based on what? Based on this, by saying, if you put the text as a source and the context as a source, and in, by the way, if you come to the very Islamic terminology, you understand that this was the case from the very beginning. You know that when we speak about the Quran, we say verses. In fact, these are not verses. Ayat means signs. Signs, so the signs that we have in the world. And in fact, when God is talking about the world, he's telling us, look at the signs. And when he's telling us, look at the book, the book is full of signs. 
So these signs that you are having, they are talking to each other. And the very understanding that you have two books is something which is very old. We got this in the Middle Age after Renaissance, taken by, for example, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali speaking about Al-Kitab al-Mastur wa Al-Kitab al-Manshur, the written book and the deployed book. These are two books. And if you have to live with laws and jurisprudence and objective, take the two books. Know the two books. Because if you only know the laws, you may betray the very meaning of the laws, but not understanding the other world, which is the context. And this context is changing. Some rules are always the same, but cultures are changing. They, they, there is in the world immutable things and changeable things, exactly as in the text. So you have to get these two knowledge. So the first, if you want to go to transformational reform, you have to put them at the same level. And the second thesis is then what we need is platforms where scholars of the text and scholars of the context sit together and produce an applied ethics by knowing the two coming together. So this is something which is quite important is there will be no way for scholars of the text to propose a transformational reform if to don't get, they don't get a deep knowledge of the state of affairs. If you are running behind the knowledge in economy, running behind the knowledge in every field, the only answers you will get is adaptation. But if you have scholars knowing the context, knowing what is happening, having a vision, they can help you in the name of a vision to come with an ethics helping you to change for the better, not to adapt whatever is the situation. So this is a very important thing. While I'm dealing with scholars coming in the field in Western Muslims, but also in Muslim majority countries, they are following, following, and they come. We have lots of fatwa, but when you read the fatwa, there is no vision, there is adaptation. There is not something which is, we change, we contribute to something. So this is why, when you were confident during the Middle Ages, and the new Muslims were coming with objectives, and not only with rules, they were able to project into the future. Now they resist to a perceived domination. And this is the very essence of a mindset that we have to change, a radical reform, which is to break this and say, now we have to change this perception by speaking first about the transformational reform, second, to put the people, and not to have, as we have, you know, we, because yesterday I was talking about the crisis of authority. If I can have three minutes to just go to my conclusion, but uh, yesterday I was talking about the crisis uh, of authority in, in Islam among the scholars, and which is true, this is a problem, who is talking for whom, but it's deeper than that. Even now, we may, don't, we may not have a, a clergy, we don't have you know, a priest in Islam, but now we have a, a, a very new circles of ulama dealing with the text and telling us the right answers to everything which is a new cast of people, circles, where they are coming. I respect these people, I respect their knowledge, but I want them to be connected to the world, not by having this you know, uh, status of power and authority. And if you look at some people say, we are the ulama, and they are the khubara, the specialists. And if you know Arabic, you understand that there is a level which is different between al ulama, al ilm, which is knowledge, the true knowledge, and khubara, specialists, that, okay, mutakhassisun, they know about the issue, but not at the same level. While in fact, someone who is a medical doctor is a alim. He has the knowledge of his very specific field. So you have to put him at the same level, because we are dealing with knowledge, and we are trying to come with an applied ethics, knowing the text, understanding the context, and having a vision by coming with both. So, in the third chapter, I'm coming with something which is a new categorization of the ethics and the applied ethics in Islam by saying that what we had in the Middle Ages with the six main principles coming from Abu al-Shatibi uh, uh, are not enough. We have to be more specific. So it's a proposal to be discussed at least. The problem I have is that very often the people are coming, they have very superficial reading of this and we are not even talking about this. This is the very essence of a proposal on a new applied ethics or Islamic applied ethics. So this is one coming as a, a proposal. And the last point for me, which is coming as a conclusion of all what I have been trying to do, is when you say this, you, are, you understand that what I'm proposing is, is clearly a shift in the center of gravity of authority in Islam. A shift by saying, ethics will not only come by the scholars of the text. 
So their authority should be open to other authorities coming with other knowledge. And by saying this, many people, and very, you know, I have some problem with some Muslim scholars saying you are shaking the whole, you know, uh, hierarchy by saying this. In fact, it's not a call against them. It's a call towards the ordinary Muslims who are specialists in their field that are not involved in the process. It's to call the community to take their share of responsibility on the process of producing applied ethics. This is exactly the opposite. It's to say you cannot blame the leaders and the scholars when the followers are accepting a state of affairs where they don't have the share of responsibility in producing an applied ethics. For example, when you are an economist or when you are a medical doctor, when you are a woman. The main problem I have with women in the Muslim community is two things. First is men. And the second thing is the victim mentality. And the victim mentality is to look at the, at the state of affairs by saying, oh, in the, you, they are they are having a perception of Islam which is a very close, uh, narrow-minded, and to blame the scholars, okay, where are the women, Muslim scholars, of the text and the context, because we need both. We don't only, you know, very often when you speak about women, say, okay, let us talk to women specialists of the context. No, we need women specialists of the text. Coming together with men, by the way, it's not men against women, it's men and women in the name of the principles challenging patriarchy, projection, reduction, all this should be done, but should be done with the two knowledges together, because this is the only way to transform the reality and to transform uh, it for the better. So I would say here that uh, uh, the main thing here is a shift in the center of gravity of authority in Islam in this, but it's coming to the fundamentals, usul al fiqh And half of the book is about case studies. And you know where we were able to do this now? At the highest level is in medical sciences. Muslim scholars, ulama of the text, are sitting with medical doctors and the Kuwait uh, Association, World Association, is doing something which is very great. For the last 30 years, they have been working on that. And they came with the highest fatwa, with a vision. In everything which is, uh, you know, cloning, euthanasia, and all this, there are abortion, contraception, all this is there. And they are coming at that level. Because this is a field where we have been doing like this. In economy, or even in ecology, look at what the Muslims are proposing. Very, very superficial thing. We don't have a vision. We are following the footsteps of the global discussion, but not coming with a vision for the future. While if you come back to the text and you understand that the text, we're dealing with a specific context, there are an ecological message in the very essence of Islam, if we understand the objective. And not to be obsessed with the way we kill animals and not the way we keep them alive. You know, the technicality of what is halal is problematic. Tell me how you kill the animals, I will tell you it's halal or haram. But the way they are kept alive, the way we are treating them, is as if it's not important. This is a very narrow understanding of what halal is when it comes to respecting the sacred dimension of life, even for the species and the animals. So this is a field. In economy, we are, I talked about this yesterday, I, want, I, I don't want come, to come back on, uh, to this, but this is something which is adaptational reform. We come with a window of halal and we say the, there is an ocean of haram. But what is coming from uh, Muslim majority countries, all the petromonarchies, they are completely in the global order. They are not coming with anything which is an alternative. And the scholars, they are just telling you, yes, I know there is a desk over there in this bank, it's halal. But the whole system, based on speculation and no ethics in economy, if there is something that we have to do together, Christian, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, people of principles, is to put some ethics in economy. So to come to, with something which is deeper than what we are doing. Where are the Muslims? Adaptation. A window, which is halal. It's a problem. It's the mindset which is wrong. And then we have to go towards a, 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 a radical reform on this, on culture, arts, anything that there are seven fields that I'm mentioning in the book. I don't have time to go for this, but this is why I think the whole philosophy of this radical reform, and please understand me well, it's not reforming Islam. It's reforming the Muslim minds because at the end of the day, my main thesis is this one. The Muslims are not at the level of what Islam is expecting from them. Thank you.
So now, now you know why we've been trying to get Tariq Ramadan here all these years. And I know you're speaking about transformation. Yes. <laughs> And I know you're talking about transformation of the Muslim mindset, but I can say as a Christian, I felt deeply touched by your remarks, and I think you speak to all of us. Now, we have an opportunity for questions. Um, there are two microphones. If you please gather in lines in the two microphones, and while people are gathering, uh, let me acknowledge uh, the people who have been trying to bring you here for the last five years, including Diana Eck, uh, one of my previous uh, presidents of the American Academy of Religion, Jack Fitzmaier, the current executive director, Barbara T. Concini, the previous executive director, uh, Scott Appleby, and the good people at uh, Notre Dame University who join with us on an appeal, a legal appeal, which we've had to the U.S. government uh, low these many years to try to uh, return uh, this uh, absurd decision that would not allow you to come to the United States, and I hope that soon uh, you will be able to be there. In the meantime, you see, we didn't go all the way to Europe. You weren't all able to come all the way to the United States, but we met you midway. So we're delighted you're here. Yes, a question over here. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question regarding the spirit of the law and the idea of returning to capture the essence of the spirit of the law or of the, the early message. Uh, so starting about a little over 100 years ago, two great pioneers in Islamic reform, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, and Muhammad Abdu considered themselves Salafis. Today that word refers and is most often used to refer to a kind of pan-global Islamic Wahhabism, if you will. But the Salafi message originally was to exactly what you're speaking about, capturing the spirit of the law. Shortly thereafter, the focus on that early period led to a radical a radical literalism in the reading of the texts and that movement dissipated into what we know happened over the course of the 20th century. On the other hand, the focus on the spirit of the law dispersed the meaning of the text to mean, you know, to have an interpretive free-for-all. Yesterday, you mentioned that democratizing the religious sciences is not necessarily a good thing. So my question to you is, in developing a hermeneutics, how do we manage the parameters of that essence or that spirit to make sure it doesn't go in one radical literalist reading and another radical dissipated dispersed meaning? Thank you very much. And before he responds, let's take a question from each side and please try to restrain your question to about one sentence or so. So a question from this side and then to respond to both. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, first, I would like to hear about the principles that you are talking about Universal principle is something that is really abstract. Uh, what are the principles that we can make sense of it in practical uh, activities, for example? And how, how do we uh, implement these principles of Islam uh, in practical sense, for example? How do we translate it into our answer to two issues? The consumption of pork product, for example, and the second one is how Islam would res respond using the principles that you are suggesting, how Muslims should respond to LGBT issues. Thank you. Yes. Could you respond to both? To, to what was it? Respond to what issue? LGBT issues. Lesbian, gay. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, as to the first question, be careful because uh, once again, um, I have been trying to explain, and, and this sometimes was used against me, uh, the very meaning of Salafi. And this is why we have to be cautious in the way we understand this. In fact, Salafi means, you know, normatively, it's the, the third, uh, three generations of Muslims coming after the, 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 the Prophet with him and just after him. And then in these followers, uh, the three generation, and they were people, literalists. And this is known in the Islamic tradition, in the people who are following Abdullah ibn Omar, very literalist. And they were people following the, the objectives. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was one reference of a, an informal school of thought saying, we need to know the objectives. And in fact, it's coming from 
a dispute that, was, that happened among companions of the prophet uh, when he said to a group of people, don't pray before reaching this place. And some understood, he told, and they went, they went there. And in fact, it was the time for praying. And some people said, he told us, don't pray before going there. And the others said, no, but it's time of praying. And the two, there was a, 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 a dispute, and some people were saying, he meant hurry up to be there before the prayer. So we are going to pray because we have to pray. So he meant something. The objective of what we, he said was go, there, hurry up to go there. And the other said, no. He said, no, we don't pray, even if it's time. And when they came back, he acknowledged the two interpretations. This is quite important. Why? Because in the Islamic tradition, we have two kind of Salafi understanding. Some are very literalists, and others are knowing the objectives. The Salafi of the 19th century, the way they were portraying themselves by saying, we are in a Salafi, al-Ula, are the people who were coming with this understanding of the objectives. And the objectives as something which is not a literalist. Now what we have, the Salafiyya coming from Saudi Arabia and petro monarchies now, are much more inter, uh, interpretation that are literalists. And by the way, they don't uh, talk about themselves as Wahhabi, they talk about themselves as Salafi, because it gives them the credentials of following in the footsteps of the first generations. So we have two trends here using the same word, but not meaning the same thing, because this is coming from the roots of what I'm, I'm explaining here. The point for me is just to say, be careful in Al-Afghani and Muhammad Abdu, they were, yes, in this uh, tajdidi, uh, islahi, uh, and using ishtihad, which is the critical thinking, but mainly, once again, very often dealing with law and jurisprudence. And my, 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 my take on the whole thing is that this is important, but it's not enough. We have to come to the fundamentals, uh, the sources, and, and to bring into the discussion the context with scholars of the context and scholars knowing what we have to do. In fact, the very uh, 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 suggestion that came from Muhammad Abdu and was dismissed by Al-Afghani saying we need to work in education to change the mind. It's a long process. While Al-Afghani was much more about get rid of the leaders and you will change the society. So we had this discussion. For me today, it's, uh, it's really to acknowledge the fact that we need knowledge with texts. And I want the people to, 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 to really, we are in academia here, and it's quite important to take the text seriously. Anything that you want in changing something in the Muslim majority countries or within the Muslim community, take the text seriously. And it's not by, not getting, you know, and say, okay, it's open to everyone. And I said this yesterday, it's about knowledge, knowing the overall message and to come to this. But the point for me is that knowing the text is not enough to change the world and to change the self. So this is why I want people with this knowledge, for example, I'm quite sure that there is a woman way of reading the Quran. And there is a woman way to deal with the current issues about women about subjugation, emancipation, autonomy. This is a very important discussion, so we need to bring them. Not by saying to every woman, read the text and do whatever you are going to do with it, it's not going to work, but to put the people together. And the critical discussion is the way to keep the norms and to open the interpretations. This is the way I would see the whole problem. About uh, uh, the principle, I, you know, it, I, I talked for, for, for almost half an hour. It was difficult for me to just to set all these principles. But if you come back to the, the, the text, the third chapter is really trying to set all these principles for our time and, and even to come with a categorization in principles that, has to do with, that have to do with inner life. Because I really think that in our time today, we really have to come with objectives dealing with inner life. It's not only about business, economy. It's about what do you want to achieve, this inner stability this transmission of, of meaning. The next book is The Quest for Meaning, because I think that we need to, you know, there will be no ethics if we don't come to the essential. Are we yes or not in a quest for meaning? Because if not, it's just about what? Technicalities? Is just to make more money in a transparent way? Or if even to ask yourself, are you questioning the beings and the havings? This is a deep question for me, and I think that this is set in the book in the third chapter. Now, of course, we are in a situation where you can say, uh, look, 
we dismiss the text and, and gays and lesbians and, and all the new issues about the way we deal with the problem is just uh, forget about the text. I would say no. I would say I need a deep understanding of the text, but also a deep understanding of the context to know how to deal with this and to be able, for example, to say the, the scriptural sources in Islam are not promoting and they are even very harsh and this is something that you can find in, in the Dalai Lama and the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition condemning homosexuality or saying it's no, it's prohibition. The point is the text are saying this, are you going to stop on the text or not to deal with the reality? And then you have to understand that you may change the mentality of the people. The texts are saying something for you as something which is not promoting homosexuality. But are you going to deal with homosexuals and lesbians in your daily life? You may disagree with what they do but you respect who they are. And this is the starting point of our living together. I think that this is a very important point, is to be able and to understand that the very essence of jurisprudence in Islam and law in, is a, a, a judgment on the actions, not on the people. So even if someone is telling you, I am a believer, but I'm a homosexual, it's not of your business to put him or her outside the realm of Islam. You can't do that. You may consider it is a sin, you may consider this, but you have no authority to put someone outside the realm of his or her religion. So this balanced approach between saying no to an action and respecting the people is also a mindset, is the way you deal with the problem, and it's a question of education. And I would say that this is the only way, but to come and to say, no, let it be open to everyone and there is no text, you're not going to be followed neither by Muslims, nor by Jews, nor by Christians, nor even by Buddhists. It's not the way. Change the mentalities respecting the texts. But to deny the text, you will change neither the text, not deal in a serious way with the mentalities of the people. So this is the way I would, I would put it in, in, in action or implementing that. The next two questions from this side. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you a question related to your book on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wa sallam, because I found that book very useful in the sense that by emphasizing the Prophet's narrative, by emphasizing the diachronic narrative of his life, instead of focusing on cutting his life up into bits and pieces as a source of usul al-fiqh, as a source of, of sharia, it points to the inherent notions of akhlaq and insaniyat as indigenous Islamic concepts, not something borrowed from the West. And it seems to me that part of what you're saying is that when we focus on a clock, we not only find ways to talk outside of the Islamic tradition, but we allow different kinds of Muslims to talk to each other, as Alevis and Ismailis and Sunnis and Shias. And that leads me to, to ask the question, when we put the Prophet as a source for fiqh at the center of our discourse, doesn't this problematize us things in ways that, that go away when we look at the Prophet as a source for our clock? Thank you. And another uh, question from this side? Yes. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Ramadan. Um, a, when we talk about the responsibility of the Muslims, and I very much agree with your approaching the transformational process rather than adaptational, shouldn't we take into consideration the uh, political complexities of the situations in which transformational movements could be very threatening to some existing conditions in which Muslims are living? Secondly, I think it would be wonderful if you did mention uh, some actual movements happening in the Muslim world, like, for example, Iranian women who are under in very, very difficult conditions, actually being very transformational from within the tradition with things like the One Million Signature Campaign and consistent movements for a reinterpretation of uh, Islam with regards to gender from within the tradition. And I think for Muslims to hear it rather than consistently hearing that they're not doing enough could be inspirational. Thank you. Yes. Uh, about the, 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 you know, for the first question, you know, I decided to go for a, a, a sirah uh, writing the prophet's life exactly for the reasons that you are mentioning. Because I really think that, yes, we have two sets of texts, the Quran and the prophetic traditions, and we have texts dealing with norms and rules, and this is quite important. I'm taking this seriously. But at the end of the day, his life, the way he, he translated this in action, in motion, and the way he was dealing with people, this is the right way to deal with rules, in fact, and to be able to come to 
okay, we may disagree on our interpretations, but you cannot disagree on the way he was dealing. This is his life. This is the way he was. So this is why the subtitle is very important. It's the sp contemporary and spiritual lessons for today. It's really this. It's about the spiritual dimension because I have a problem today with the, 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 the Islamic uh, narrative and discourse is really that we are once again obsessed with rules and not so much obsessed with meanings. And I think that the Sira is keeping, giving again the whole dimension of meanings because he was translating this. Add to this that sometimes it's very good to deal with some specific ahadith which are uh, dealing with rules in the light of his life to understand the way he was dealing with this and that sometimes it's, it's you know, the wisdom of his implementation, his understanding, listening to people, loving the people, all this is so important. So I got criticism coming from people who say, oh, it's not a scientific book. No, the subtitle is Contemporary and Sp Sp Spiritual Lessons. So it's really about these deep lessons of meanings. Why? Because these meanings could project onto the text, the Quran itself, that we, when we read it chronologically, uh, helping us to a better understanding. So I completely agree with this, and I think that this is the way I want to push uh, this discussion. And, and knowing that even, you know, very, by also relying on very specific sources, the Salafi, the literalists, were not able to criticize the book on the principles or on the, the, the references. So it came to interpretations of his life. And here we have a much interesting discussion about this. And I, I would say that even, for example, when I'm saying, look, in the Prophet's time, in the mosques, they were together in the same room, and there was a sense of respect, and women were coming to pray. Why is it that in the 21st century, the 15th century, you have mosques in Muslim-majority countries, as well as in the West, where it's not possible? Are you following in the footsteps of the Prophet, or are you creating a new segregated understanding of Islam? So his example is giving us the answer beyond the, the rules or the text, and I think that this is quite important. Um, I, I agree with the, what you said at the, at the end. I think that it's very often, uh, it's very important to, to come with inspirational uh, examples to, to give this strength. And I, I completely agree with this. This was not uh, what I wanted to do by, by coming with uh, uh, criticism. But sometimes uh, uh, I think it's good to, to hear uh, for Muslims and non-Muslims by saying, OK, look, victim mentality is the starting point of failure. It's really this that we have to change. Now, so many Muslim women and so many Muslims are doing things at the local level that are so impressive, far from the, you know, the, the media coverage, the, the polarization in our capitals at the grassroots level. In, throughout the world, I saw, for example, in the in economy, for example, people uh, uh, working in uh, you know, alternative businesses, very interesting and the microfinance, very interesting. They are doing the job. These are the people I like. These are the people, they don't care about the media coverage, they care about principles and objectives. So, and women, you spoke about Iranian women, but around the world, I can tell you that last week, for example, a connection of women in Saudi Arabia decided we are going to continue the struggle for education, for being able to drive cars, because it's completely crazy to say that this is Islamically forbidden. So these are women, and, and I think that this is why we have to come together and understand that these are uh, uh, trends that are important. Now, let me tell you something. You know, I'm coming here and saying, yesterday we had a very interesting inter uh, discussion with Nilfer Gilly. She came and she said something which is quite important. It may be, that's better like this. Uh, it means that we have to stop. No, no. <laughs> but it's better. Uh, uh, she was saying about the fact that, okay, we are speaking about Muslims in the West, or Western Muslims, saying that it may be that there is in Islam something which is uh, pushing the Muslims to go towards transformation and not only to accept the state of affairs when it comes to the, the, the situation of our societies. And I would, I preferred before, okay. Uh, I, I would say that uh, I really agree with this. I think that there is something, which, when you come back to the applied ethics, uh, and I think that this is central here. But also when I'm, I'm reading anything which is coming from uh, 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 Christian ethics, 
or Jewish ethics. Anything which is also coming with what I, I, I saw in, in, in India with Buddhists and coming with uh, implementation of ethics on the ground. The point is really to transform. So this transformational reform is not accepted in an easy way by all the people. So when people are expecting from me as a Western Muslim, you adapt and you become invisible. So the best Muslim is a Muslim which is not visible. I think that I can understand that I can be a danger. I can be a danger, why? Because I'm within, I'm a European, I'm a Westerner, but I'm also part of the whole discussion and I want this world to be better. So I'm not going to give up on ethics and critical discourse. When, for example, I'm saying the only true citizens in a country are the critical citizens, so meaning the loyalty is always critical. Critical loyalty is the only way to be loyal. So it's not you are with us or against us. The dignity of the states, are, I'm so, I'm, you said about AAR and other organizations supporting me, but from where I was, I was able to see the dignity of the US is not the Bush administration. These are these people saying no to a, a rhetoric saying you are with us or against us. No, we are with principles, and when you betray the principles, we are going to be against. This is the transformational reform. But you know that by talking like this, you don't only have friends. <laughs> Ask yourself why sometimes this discourse is controversial in the West, but also in Muslim-majority countries. You know that Western Muslims and the future of Islam in Malaysia is considered as a book which is a dangerous book. Because I'm challenging what they tell us about Islamic economy as something which is a new way, and they don't like it. They don't like the criticism that I am, I am uh, uh, addressing to the project itself, while I'm supportive of so many other things. So I would say that uh, uh, this, this discussion is not a simple one. We can be happy with it here because it talks about ethics, but you should know that people have other interests. So ethic and ethical discourse could be dangerous for people willing to have power or to make money. Question from here and a question from there. Okay, I just have a, a, a brief comment and then a, my question. Um, one thing is I'm, I'm really heartened by your bringing Islamic spirituality back into the discussion when it comes to Islamic reform. Because, um, I mean, if you look at the classical tradition, uh, Sufis or Islamic spirituality, the teachers of Islamic spirituality, were the ones who called the fuqaha or the jurists to transformation, right? They were the ones who called them to a, a higher uh, a place. And in the modern period, the separation between Islamic spirituality from is the rest of the Islamic tradition is something that I feel um, has really cheapened uh, the discussion surrounding the transformative, po transformative power of Islam. So I, I wanted to thank you for that. Um, about my, my question, actually it refers to, uh, it deals with your reference to the scholars of text and the scholars of context. And um, again, looking at the classical tradition, the scholars of text saw themselves as being required to also be scholars of context. And even in the 18th century, for instance, major Hanafi jurists saying, um, doing jurisprudence without knowledge of custom is a loom, it's an oppression, right? So, but the way, the way you were framing it almost seemed like scholars of context and scholars of text today are two different sets of people. And why is that? Are you saying that our context is just a lot more complicated when compared to pre-modern context? Is that a way, uh, and then I would ask, is that a way of privileging our context over past context? Good, thank, thank you, you for that question. Any question from here? Uh, yes. Um, as we wind down this session, I would um, actually ask you to um, indulge us as not only a scholar, but as a world-famous public intellectual who's constantly be at, being, being asked to make statements, uh, un, uh, unequivocal statements, about uh, problems and perceived threats from the Muslim world. And as you know, you've been accused of being slippery, evasive, and, and using doublespeak. And in fact, in your recent book, what I believe, um, I read that book largely as a defense against the accusation of doublespeak. However, just yesterday, when you were asked about the, uh, the fatwa against Rushdie, I heard doublespeak. And I'd like to ask you on a specific issue, 
also your, your, your rejection of Robin Wright's um, way of presenting the narrative in the Islamic world seemed to me that you were avoiding discussing, deliberately avoiding discussing the threat and the problem, which is real, not just perceived, of violence in the Islamic world. I'd like to add to that a question, and I pray for an unequivocal single-speak answer about the rising, in fact, the overwhelming um, rise of um, virulent anti-Semitism in the Muslim world not just in the Arab world, and I'm not asking you to talk about Zionism or the State of Israel because the old distinctions that used to be made between Zionists and Jews isn't even bothered with anymore. It's just kill the Jews. I just uh, recently saw a tape of hundreds of school children in Indonesia who never met a Jew. If they did, he was a tourist, um, screaming, we are going to Jerusalem to kill the Jews. And the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, I don't have to tell you, is a bestseller in, on the streets of Cairo. The blood libel is televised on TV in both Egypt and Saudi Arabia as a matter of historical fact. And so I would ask you, in your capacity as a very influential public intellectual, to unequivocally uh, respond to uh, this very disturbing and overwhelming anti-Semitism which has now permeated the Muslim world. Thank, Thank you. Two good questions. Um, about spirituality and, and coming back to this, I, I, once again, I'm challenging and I think that this distinction that we had between anything which is coming from the spiritual dimension and as opposed to the fuqaha and the jurists, I think that this is very, very dangerous and we really have it. We, we should understand that spirituality is, is the heart and the light of anything which has to do with norms and, and laws because this is where we find the meaning. So it's not only to come back, it's really even in the, 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 the traditions uh, the tradition, the Islamic, the classical Islamic tradition, is to be able to to come to this and to 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 get a better understanding. And 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 as I told you, very often I go through the spiritual understanding of concepts to understand the normative under, uh, uh, translation of words and concepts like jihad or, or like uh, even here uh, uh, transformation of the self and transformation of the world, the very meaning of transform of reform itself. Now about uh, why am I saying that we have to, to bring on board uh, scholars of the ulama al nusus wa ulama al waqa the scholars of the context, because... Sorry, this will have to be the last answer because I'm told that we have to wind up, so the answer the, to both the, these the, questions the will have to be your last answer. No, I, okay, I will respond because and if unfortunately I, if we, I, if we I, won't have time for any more questions, so thank you, but... We're eager to hear your response to both I, I need, Yes, I need to respond to the <laughs> second one as well. Yes. Uh, about the, I think that uh, what was the case uh, uh, in the 7th century, 8th century, even in the Middle Ages, is that for some scholars to get all this knowledge together, for example, uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq, uh, who was a scholar for the Shia and the Sunni tradition as well, he was the teachers of Abu Hanifa and Malik, uh, these scholars were able to gather knowledges of so many fields in the at the same time because this was the level of knowledge of his time. Now it's not impossible. The knowledge, for example, in anything which has to do with medical sciences, you can't have both. You cannot get the very... And by the way, even the knowledges of the text and the hadith, now it's so, so precise in anything which is authentic at the highest level that even scholars dealing with the text should be specialized in a very specific area to be able to respond to this because the complexity of the, 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 the knowledge of today means that one person, one scholar cannot answer all the, 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 the fields because it's too complicated. The complexification of sciences and the gathering on all this knowledge makes it impossible now for one man or one woman to get all this. So we need to have voices, competences, and so it's not to, uh, as you said, to, to give a, a, a specific way to the concept of today. This is the reality on both fields. Uh, we have a more uh, uh, complex uh, uh, knowledge to, to, uh, uh, to get and, and, and to deal with. A uh, question on violence. So two things about uh, what you said. I don't know, you know, first the book, what I believe is not uh, a book uh, uh, to defend, is to clarify. It's not a book on the defensive. I'm just saying this is what I think and I hope the people are going to stop going on Google or in Wikipedia to think about or to maybe uh, approach my uh, thoughts, just read. 
a very short book for people who are in a hurry. <laughs> the second point is what I said about the, the fatwa against Salman Rushdie, that I condemned the fatwa from the very beginning. If this is not clear, I don't know how I can be clearer than that. This is second. Third, uh, very often I'm, yes, accused of having a double talk. I'm always saying to the people who come with the evidences and what you are just saying now is just showing me that there is a lack of reading for the last 20 years. I have been one of those saying to the Muslims, anti-Semitism by definition is anti-Islamic. So there is no discussion for me to confuse the fields. Anything which has to do to condemn or to criticize or to judge or to reject a Jew for the simple reason that he or she is Jew is unacceptable. As all the racisms, unacceptable. There is no hierarchy in racisms. All unacceptable. So there is no discussion. I wrote this and I said it in 94 in tapes to Muslims. I wrote it in 2001 in Le Monde. I repeated and repeated. And this is it. So I don't think that here, so when now you are telling me don't speak about Zionists and all this, I'm saying this, and at the same time, I'm saying to all the governments of the world, I will never stop criticizing you if you betray the principles. Saudi Arabia, Israel, and any other country. There is no difference here. But when I'm saying this, and I think that this is clear, so I'm always saying to people, it may be sometimes that when you think of projecting as a double talk is on the side of the people who are hearing a double talk, that there is a double hearing. So let us find our way. Tariq Ramadan, thank you so much for being here. It was worth the wait.